Welcome everyone to the Digital Economy Lunch Seminar Series. Uh, the Digital Economy Lab at Stanford is a new research center focusing on understanding the effects of digital technologies on the economy and society. Uh, we bring together some of the leading researchers from around the world and, and we host a regular seminar series, which you are now attending. Uh, we're delighted to have with us today, Professor Melissa Dell. Uh, she's the Andrew Fuhrer Professor of Economics at Harvard University. And she's the 2020 recipient of the John Bates Clark Medal, which is awarded each year to the American economist under the age of 40, who's made the most significant contributions to economic thought and knowledge. Uh, in 2018, The Economist magazine named her as one of the decade's eight top economists. And in 2014, she was named as the IMF as the uh, youngest of 25 economists under age 45, who's thought, thinking about the global economy. Um, her research focuses on economic growth and the political economy. She's examined a number of factors leading to the persistence of poverty and prosperity in the long run, trade induced job loss, uh, impacts of foreign intervention, and a number of other interesting topics. Um, today, she's going to talk about a project she's been doing where she developed a deep learning powered methods for curating social science data at scale. And she's released an open source package called Layout Parser. Uh, this work supports many of her current projects, which rely on digitizing historical sources uh, that are far too large for manual digitization. So welcome, Melissa. We're delighted to have you here. Uh, thank you for joining us for the lunch seminar series. Uh, thanks so much for the introduction and thank you everyone uh, for, uh, for joining us today. So see i will just Melissa, while you get your slides up let me just uh tell the the uh, audience yeah. that you can uh, ask questions uh through the q a function um at zoom and we will uh take melissa hopefully you can save 10 or 15 minutes at the end for for general questions if anyone has a clarifying question feel free to put that into uh the q a function as well and uh and i may uh ask melissa while she's speaking but we're going to do most of the questions at the end so with that i'll hand it back to you melissa Yep, I'm not sh okay. Now I seem to be authorized to share my slides. Perfect. Okay, can hopefully everybody, um, hopefully everybody can see that. Um, and so yep. I'm going to be yep. talking today. Yep. Um, let's see about uh, deep learning methods for curating economic data at scale. And so yep. I think you could go to full screen mode, maybe. Or, yeah. Is it not? It seems to be showing here. Let me stop sharing and try again because it's showing full screen for me. But uh, oh, OK, yeah, it might be on a different monitor. I don't know. Let's see. Let me let me try again. Is that full screen now? Looks great. Great. Thanks so much. Sorry about the technical challenges. Um, you'd think we would have learned Zoom by this point, but not necessarily. Okay, um, and so the reason I'm really excited to be here and talking about this today is because data curation is such a central part of economic research. It shapes the questions that are feasible for us to answer, but it also shapes the questions that we think to pose. Um, and so in economics, um, we're often a very applied field. If we don't think that there's data um, that can be accessed to test a question, we won't think you know, to focus on that. Um, and as a relatively young discipline, empirical economics has really barely begun to scratch the surface in terms of answering questions that are important to people's lives and that are important to the well-functioning of societies. And um, so deep learning in particular has powered many recent scientific achievements by providing powerful tools for creating computable representations from raw information. You know, so whether it be, you know, landing a, a self-flying rover on Mars or changing how doctors diagnose disease, um, taking raw information that is not in its raw form computable and converting that into representations that can be used for whatever downstream task needs to be done has just been an incredibly uh, powerful uh, paradigm in many fields. And I think that the same deep learning methods have enormous potential. Um, for similar applications in economics. So essentially to convert masses of non-computable raw information into structured data. And so in our applications in economics, rich data are oftentimes trapped in image scans of uh, tables or administrative records, other documents. 
they could be in other types of image data as well. Um, or there might be information that um, we would like to analyze that is in large amounts of raw text. And so just to give a little bit of background, um, there's a very long history of computing um, in economics and in social science research, uh, but it was really the advent of personal computing in the 1990s that revolutionized the discipline. Before this time period, economics was largely a theoretical uh, field. Um, and personal computing really changed that and completely changed the types of data that could be collected. It made it feasible um, for researchers themselves to go into the field and collect data and really change the types of data that could be uh, actually processed. And this in turn had a fundamental influence on the questions that we asked. And so, for example, um, development economics as a field didn't really uh, start until the advent of personal computing. A lot of issues that we're interested in in development may be more kind of difficult to model theoretically, at least with the tools that people had at the time. And there was just really kind of a lack of data. And that's totally changed with people collecting their own data, getting large data sets that can be analyzed. Um, and so, you know, essentially like a question, you know, that, that, um, that I would like to ask is, can deep learning spur another empirical revolution in economics? Um, because I think that there's a lot of parallels to what we saw 25 years ago. So there's been recent monumental advances in computing, um, whether it be GPU compute or the availability of cheap cloud compute that makes it possible to process data on a scale that would have been previously unimaginable. You know, so um, for example, my group has been for the past several months using a thousand virtual CPUs on Microsoft Azure to process uh, tens of millions of document scans. You know, before that technology existed, you know, obviously I wouldn't have had a thousand uh, CPUs sitting in my office to process the information. And so it's just, um, again, there's these advances that are really changing what information that we can process and what information can be data in the first place. And I think that that has real potential to expand the universe of questions that we are able to study. Um, and um, there's kind of two angles to this. Um, and so a central kind of set of questions that we care about in economics is how societies change, how they grow over time. Um, and answering these questions really well often requires highly uh, granular microeconomic data on the trajectories of individuals, firms, individual communities, oftentimes rich disaggregated data historically that we can look at over a long period of time do exist, um, but they're often trapped in hard copy and they're just too large to digitize by hand. And so deep learning based automated approaches allow digitization of data sources that you know, we're kind of already aware of, we'd like to use, but we haven't been able to. Um, but also they can unlock new types of data. And there's so many different examples of this. You know, so just to take you know, uh, one example, um, there's the old saying that a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, with deep learning methods, it's straightforward to track the dissemination of images across tens of millions of pages of historical newspapers or other historical media forms, whereas you would have never you know, done that by hand. And so um, in, in both of these respects, it, it really has an enormous amount of potential. Um, I'd say that you know, there's been considerable efforts to incorporate machine learning methods into econometrics. Um, but deep learning methods have been used less frequently to process raw data in economics than they have been in some other disciplines. So certainly there's examples of, being the, of them being used, but it hasn't really caught on to the same extent that we've seen in, in some other fields. Um, and deep learning resources that are tailored towards economic applications are quite limited. And I think this is driven more by supply than by a lack of interest. And so, um, you know, I've been working um, uh, with um, students and RAs to provide resources um, that will hopefully help to fill in some of these gaps. Um, and that's uh, really what I'd like to talk uh, more about today. Okay. Um, 
So I'm going to uh, start out by giving some motivating examples of the types of data that we can access using uh, deep learning based methods for curating data that would otherwise be unaccessible. And I'll say a word about why deep learning, because this is a question that I get all the time. Isn't there another way to do this that doesn't require kind of um, making these investments to, to learn about deep learning? Um, and um, you know, I'm going to argue that in most cases, um, no, when it comes to automated data curation, deep learning is likely to significantly outperform alternative approaches. Um, and then I want to spend most of the time focused on an open source package that my group has uh, released called Layout Parser, um, which allows for doing a uh, document image analysis at scale um, using a uh, simple, straightforward to use uh, Python APIs. Okay, sorry, my slides seem to have a little bit of a lag here. Um, okay, so I want to start out by giving some, um, uh, some motivating examples of the sorts of data that can be uh, processed using deep learning based approaches, um, giving a couple of examples of projects that, that my group has been working on lately. And so uh, one of our ongoing projects is to extract structured data from historical newspapers at scale. Um, and uh, we're currently using deep learning to extract data from over 50 million page scans that span over 10,000 US newspapers and uh, more than a century of time. And being able to extract this structured data will allow us to use state-of-the-art NLP um, methods um, to answer a variety of questions that otherwise would be unaccessible. And so, if you're to take a scan of a historical newspaper and just um, load it into a off the shelf OCR engine like Tesseract or Google Cloud Vision, um, it will almost always fail miserably. Um, and so what the OCR engine will do is to read the newspaper like it's a single book going from left to right. Usually newspapers have multiple columns and so all the words will end up scrambled together. It's not going to be able to separate out headlines um, from captions, from advertisements. Um, and this is true, you know, there's an example uh, that I've shown here, but even on relatively simple layouts, so this has two columns on the top and three columns on the bottom, um, the um, commercial OCR softwares get really confused. They can't recognize the layouts. They read it like it's a single column book or actually the output is just completely um, unstable. The bounding boxes they're showing in blue don't make much sense. Um, and so this is reflected in what people tend to study on. So existing historical newspaper data sets um, typically will limit the user to analyzing whether individual words appear um, in the newspaper. And that doesn't allow for analyses that would take as inputs, headlines, captions, sentences, paragraphs, or even full article text. Um, and if all you can do is look at the keywords that appear on the page, that might be um, fine for some research questions, but you're not going to be able to capture sentiment or to tag topics that use complex language or to trace the dissemination of content, which is often abridged um, through uh, national news markets. Um, all of these things would be possible to do um, thanks to advances in natural language processing if you actually had the full uh, structured text uh, from the documents. And so uh, what we've done is to design a pipeline um, to be able to extract that text. So we start by doing document layout analysis um, on the left there, and that allows us to recognize individual headlines, articles, captions, um, et cetera. Um, and then we digitize the content of those individual layout regions uh, using OCR. Um, we use a reading order prediction model um, to put the content back together, articles, are oftentimes wrapped across multiple columns. And then once we have that structure content, um, we use a variety of tools um, from natural language processing, you know, things like um, dense passage retrieval to locate content, uh, 
topic and sentiment classification, et cetera, in order to be able to measure what are newspapers talking about? How are they talking about it? Where did they get that content? How does content spread throughout the media, et cetera? So we can really answer a lot of very fine-grained questions using modern NLP on this structured um, text that we've been able to extract from the newspapers. Okay, um, so I'll give one other quick uh, motivating example. Um, and so as I was mentioning earlier, many questions that we really care about as economists, such as um, how resources are allocated across for firms, inequality, social mobility, uh, require disaggregated data. You're not going to be able to look at inequality if you have data that is aggregated to a county level. You're not gonna be able to look at the allocation of resources across firms if you have industry level data and not firm level data. Um, yet it's rare to have um, disaggregated data in digital formats over long periods. So usually when people are looking at these questions, you know, with a few exceptions, um, they're looking in a more uh, modern context. Um, but that makes it difficult to study these questions and over longer periods of time and to understand the role that um, these phenomena play in longer economic development. And so in particular, I have an interest in East Asia's spectacular growth performance uh, in the 20th century, which is not really um, very well understood, but efforts to understand it better with disaggregated data have been kind of in general um, unsatisfactory. And so incredibly rich firm and individual level data do exist. Um, and that's particularly true in the case of Japan. Um, but it would be completely infeasible to digitize them by hand. There's hundreds of thousands of pages of firm level records, hundreds of thousands of pages of individual level data. Even if you had an infinite budget, you're not going to find enough qualified um, people to be able to digitize these documents, which use many kind of historical characters that aren't even used in modern Japanese. Um, so really the only way to be able to uh, learn from these data is automated digitization, um, but the requirements of that um, are, are non-trivial. Could you say something just a little bit about which records you're referring to? Are these like public records or are these um, like individual firms, they might have their own private accounting records or, or, or both? Um, and so they come from they come from credit bureaus, and so there's a long history of credit research bureaus in Japan that published detailed information about firms. And so this is an example here. Um, and I know that probably most people uh, don't <laughs> don't read Japanese, um, but this is telling us for firms um, information about their balance sheets, about their personnel, about the sorts of products they make, um, etc. And so we can really learn uh, detailed information about who are the managers, who are the board members at those firms, what are they producing, who are their suppliers, who are their customers, what's their balance sheet information, et cetera. And that's, they collected this information for about 10,000 firms. Um, and so we'd like to take, you know, tens of thousands of pages that look like this um, and turn it into a structured database. So that's the, um, that's the objective. Um, and so we start by doing some pre-processing, which is based on deep learning that helps us to clean up the noisy backgrounds and just get something that's in general, like a bit of a cleaner looking um, document that's done uh, using uh, GANs. And um, then we do the layout detection. Um, and so we detect different individual layout regions of the documents. And so the variable names and their values uh, the firm headers, the addresses, um, et cetera. Um, and so with those individual layout regions, um, then we take those and we OCR those um, once we've detected the, um, the individual regions. Um, and so um, existing OCR solutions don't in general give us the accuracy that we'd like. For example, one thing that we want to use these data for is to track individuals across different firms across time, and we want to merge um, these data with individual biographies. And if you have an OCR in the person's name, that's going to be 
uh, problematic. Um, the challenge here is if you use kind of the current predominant OCR uh, uh, architecture, um, which combines a CNN with an RNN and a CTC loss. Um, that's a heavily supervised problem. Training the OCR engine takes on the order of magnitude of a, a million labels, you know, which we don't have the personnel to create. And so there's kind of a couple of different approaches. One is data augmentation, um, but what we found, and I'll say a little bit more about this later, because this is something that we would like ultimately plan to add to layout parser, is that we can actually have an unsupervised um, OCR uh, based on style GAN too late in the spaces. And so essentially, in addition to using deep learning for the layout model, um, we're using a deep learning based OCR approach um, that is much more kind of easily uh, customizable to our documents than it, you know, the kind of standard approach um, that's used in, in uh, commercial software, which is heavily supervised. Um, you know, we apply similar methods to other types of data, like um, to Japanese biographical data that you see here. Okay. Um, and so that's an example of a couple of things that, that we've been working on. Um, so before I um, delve into explaining Layout Parser, which is the open source package that we've released with the methods that we've developed, I also want to say a word about why deep learning? Um, I think, you know, especially for those who may not have a strong background in this area, um, you know, oftentimes the question is like, why, why do I need to make this investments? Why is this worthwhile? Isn't there some other approach? Um, and so generally speaking, um, if you want automated data curation, you can take one of two approaches. You can write a set of instructions that tells the computer how to process the data. Um, by defining a set of rules, or you can let the computer learn how to process the data from empirical examples using deep learning. And so uh, rule-based approaches, I think, have the advantage of being easy to understand. That's oftentimes where people want to start. Most of us are used to interacting with computers via a rule-based approach. Um, and there's certainly some places where they will work well. Um, but in general, um, we found that they perform poorly on historical documents and NLP alike. Of course, there's a massive computer science uh, literature on uh, different benchmarks that show that the deep learning based approaches greatly outperform kind of the pre deep learning more uh, human engineered rule based approaches and our experience is very consistent, not surprisingly, sort of with this massive um, literature on benchmark tasks and deep learning. Um, and essentially, I think it's actually even more true um, for a lot of the things that, that we'd like to do because complexity and noise are the enemies of rules and economic documents, especially historical economic documents, tend to have a lot of complexity and a lot of noise in them, whether it's from the aging of the document, the scanning of the document, the complex layouts that were there. And so if you want rules, then you're going to need exceptions to the rules that have to be hard coded. And then there's exceptions to those exceptions. Um, and it becomes a very uh, brittle approach. Um, what deep learning does is to allow us to learn a robust mapping between raw data and the desired output in a way that if it's done well, can accurately process new data that the model wasn't exposed to during trading. Um, so you can think of this as an incredibly powerful universal function approximator um, that has millions um, of estimated parameters. Um, people will often ask, well, as economists, do we have enough data um, to be able to do deep learning? Um, you know, our data sets may not be as, as, as big as in um, some other disciplines. Um, but fortunately, this is where the power of transfer learning comes in. Um, it's rare that we need to train a deep learning model from scratch. And because we can build upon this existing work, fine tuning existing models, um, this lowers the labeling requirements and makes it oftentimes realistic um, uh, that, um, that our context, you know, that it will be feasible to provide enough labeled data to train these models if it's a model that, that requires supervision. 
And again, I'll talk about this a little bit more in the context of layout parser. Okay, um, and so when I tell people um, about what I've been working on lately, I'd say the most common reaction is, um, but isn't there an app or some other commercial product that does this? Why are you, why are you doing this? Um, unfortunately, there are not off the shelf solutions for most economic data curation aims, whether it be in computer vision or natural language processing. Um, and existing commercial solutions often don't get even close um, to the level of acceptable accuracy that we would require. And so we can take OCR as an example. You know, I showed you a picture already of how it did on historical newspapers. Um, commercial OCR softwares are primarily trained on clean, modern documents with simple layouts and modern fonts like single column books. Um, in contrast, oftentimes as economists, we're interested in noisy historical documents that have highly complex layouts and that used fonts that are not the same as modern digital fonts. Um, because uh, the OCR architecture they're using is heavily supervised, um, the existing OCR engines almost always struggle um, with the layouts and not infrequently, they're gonna struggle with the fonts as well. You know, we're a long ways from achieving artificial general intelligence and the OCR softwares, you know, if they weren't trained on something that looks like your document, they're not going to perform with the level of accuracy that would typically be required uh, for academic research. So um, Melissa, could I ask yeah. you to, to, you know, speculate or weigh in a little bit on, on, on why commercial software hasn't, I mean, they have, an incentive. Um, there's a big market out there. There's a you know a dozen companies and some open source. Um, why aren't they making the same investments that you and your group are making? It. Um, why does it fall to your shoulders? Yeah, I think that there's a series of reasons for it. So I think a big part of the commercial market is just um, somebody who wants to, to, to scan a document that was made on a modern word processor, but for some reason they have a hard copy version of it. So I think part of it is that the, um, the commercial market looks different than the academic market. Probably your typical user of Google Cloud Vision does not want to um, digitize 1940 Japanese firm level records. Um, and so I think like that that's a little bit a part of it, but I also think it's like when you look at kind of the technology that it's based on, it's like based on like stuff that's really old, like in the context of deep learning. I mean, they're still using, you know, in, in most of these softwares, they're using an LSTM. They're not using a transformer based language model. Like um, the kind of the way they do it, you look at it and you say like, well, why haven't there been more investments, you know, I'm not like a computer scientist, but my impression from talking to people in computer science is a lot of people think that documents are kind of boring and not like the interesting thing to be working on. And OCR was something that was around in the 80s. It kind of worked then, I'm sure, on a very kind of on a very limited basis. But I think a lot of top talent in the field um, thinks it's maybe just not that interesting of a problem to work on. Um, and I think, you know, when you look at the companies that are producing OCR software, they also have a lot of other products that also have very large markets. And maybe, you know, they have a lot of their um, top talent working on face detection or something. And so, I mean, I think in some sense, um, it's actually a super fascinating problem and like, We've gotten a lot of um, inspiration, for example, from the literature on GANs that generates human faces. But for some, you know, path dependent reason, um, there's this entire literature that um, generates realistic hum looking human faces, but it hasn't, you know, um, there hasn't been a focus at all on generating realistic looking fonts, even though you could do that. And I think it has something to do with the fact that fonts are really boring <laughs> compared to human faces. So I think kind of all those, all those factors come into play, but I, I think it will improve a lot. There, there are a couple of brief questions from the Q and A. Would you like to take them now or uh, should we? Yeah. Um, yeah, so one, I, I think a pretty straightforward question is, is, can this be used for digitizing medical prescriptions also at scale? And maybe I imagine other sorts of applications like that? Yeah, definitely. Um, so um, we 
we got some funding um, from an NIH grant where there were a lot of doctors on the uh, selection committee and they ask exactly that question, can it be used for medical records? And um, absolutely. Two other questions about, well, both of them maybe relate a little bit to transfer learning uh, from, from Bradford Lynch. If you're using transfer learning, are you concerned about endogeneity when using the resulting model in any kinds of causal tests? And let me just bundle it with a, 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 another question, which is it looks like the CNN lay, for layout detection models uses the structure of the document, um, but not the semantics of the language. Is that correct? And could it be improved by also following the words in the same line? Well, I think you mentioned maybe you do that, but, but why don't you go ahead and, and take both those questions? Uh yeah, so in terms of, um, you know, in, in, in terms of whether layout models could be improved by using semantics, um, I mean, we use that some to get to the structured database. Um, and so maybe it will be a little bit more clear um, when I talk about, um, when I talk specifically about the, um, the layout parser package, um, but we, we use the text and post-processing, but I think it's true that, that in this space that there's a lot of scope for multimodal learning to be um, really helpful and sort of the state of the art um, layout detection models don't really do that at this point. There's some people that have worked on that a little bit, but of very limited scope. And so I think that, you know, having a multimodal model for layout detection that really um, takes into account um, fully the text and the images is a is a really promising um, is a really promising area for future. Um, I think you mentioned that you're doing it to find a continuation to another page of the article. Yep, yep, yep. And so we use we we definitely use the text and the processing pipeline. Um, but I think like specifically like at the sort of at the layout detection phase, right? Where you're detecting, is this a headline? Is this an article? Is this a caption? You know, in that context, we're just using the visual signature and it actually works really well because the visual signature of those things is really strong. Um, but you could imagine, you know, if you were able to have like a full multimodal model at that point, um, that that would be helpful for performance. Um, I think in terms of biases, it's going to really come down to the, um, you know, to the the problem that um, that you're trying to solve. And you know, um, I think in a lot of stuff that we do, say we want to OCR something, either the OCR is wrong or it's right. It either recognizes those characters correctly or not. And if it's been trained on you know, a data set that doesn't represent kind of the full distribution of your document, it's going to recognize characters correctly that it's been exposed to and not otherwise. And it's a little bit hard to say if that's a problem um, or not, um, just depending on what the question you want to answer is and whether that's just adding noise that will blow up your standard errors or whether that is actually going to bias your results. And so I think that just like in anything, we, we always have to keep up, keep that in mind. Um, but obviously, the more accurate it can be, the less likely um, that it, it is that those errors are going to influence results. All right. Um, OK, so um, you know, another question that I get is like, why don't you just send this off um, for manual entry? Um, they promise 99.5% accuracy, maybe to this crowd, you joined a digital economy <laughs> seminar. So um, maybe, you know, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, um, but I'll just say that, you know, um, even on a, a small scale, um, manual data entry can be unsatisfactory for a variety of reasons, including that you're not likely to actually get 99.5% uh, accuracy. And so I think that, you know, obviously if you're digitizing a small data set once, you may just want to manually digitize that. But I think that it's much more interesting to invest in learning about deep learning methods than it is to sit there and fix the problems um, in your data that happen when you send it off to India or wherever to be manually digitized. Okay. And so, you know, hopefully I've convinced you that um, with automated data curation, it can really open the door to answering new and fascinating questions. Um, but 
you're not going to find an app um, or really a commercial technology that's going to work for a lot of the documents that, that we would like to, to process um, as academic researchers. Um, and so um, I found it actually really necessary to delve into the deep learning literature to learn about what it can do. And instead of you know just using this for the purposes of what my group wants to do, we really wanted to take what we learned and share it with the research community and make it easier for other researchers to use these methods because honestly, it was like a huge amount of work for us. We didn't know where to start, um, you know, and it was just, um, you know, not a super user-friendly process. Um, and we really wanted to make it easier for other researchers to be able to process documents using uh, deep learning methods at scale. Okay, and so along those lines, um, I worked um, with um, a couple of my pre-docs, um, Zhejiang Shin and Jake Carlson and other open source collaborators um, to integrate the models and tools that we developed, you know, for example, working on the projects that I showed you earlier um, into an open source package called Layout Parser. And so the aim of Layout Parser is to streamline the use of deep learning in document image analysis pipelines. And so by document image analysis, I mean taking a raw document and converting it into structured data. Um, and it, Layout Parser aims to provide simple and intuitive interfaces for applying and customizing uh, deep learning models uh, for layout detection and other document processing tasks. Okay, um, I apologize. For some reason, I think um, my internet may be particularly bad today or my slides are really not um, transmitting super well over Zoom and there can be a lag, but um, I, I apologize. For, for, for what it's worth, Melissa, I think we actually see them a, a couple of seconds before you do. They have to go okay. there and back. So don't, don't worry, it's, it's not as bad as it looks on your end. Okay, <laughs> maybe it's, it's something. I actually haven't had this problem before, so I'm not sure, uh, but they seem to have a lot of a, a, a lag. Um, Okay, so essentially our objective is to take a document input um, that is a document image scan and to turn that into a structured database of output where the content is digitized and classified according to what type of information it contains. And to get from that document input to the structured output, we need a document image analysis pipeline. Okay, and so currently there's no full-fledged infrastructure for easily curating document image data sets and fine-tuning or retraining layout analysis models. Um, and to the extent that resources exist, they're often in different repositories, they use inconsistent backends. Um, and so this, both makes it kind of difficult for research teams uh, to learn about how full pipelines are implemented and reduces transparent, uh, transparency. And so to the extent that you're trying to put together a DIA pipeline from scratch, you might use one thing uh, for, in one language for pre-processing and then you use something else for layout detection, a test of, you know, something else for character recognition, post-processing, storage, and it just makes it very difficult for other researchers to reproduce what you do. And it makes it difficult for you to implement that pipeline. Um, so ideally a document image analysis toolkit should be simple, comprehensible, uh, customizable, extensible, and open source. Um, and so Layout Parser has several components that aim at that. Um, there's an off-the-shelf toolkit for applying deep learning models for layout detection, character recognition, and other document image analysis tasks, a repository of pre-trained neural network models uh, that underlies off-the-shelf usage, comprehensive tools for efficient document image data, data annotation and model fine-tuning, and then finally, a community hub, and the libraries implemented with simple Python APIs.
Okay. And so if you want to do layout detection off the shelf, and here's an example here, just taking a, a a page from one of our papers, you can do that with three lines of code. Um, so we can look at this a little bit more closely. Um, you just need to specify the model configuration um, with one line of code. Um, and um, then you uh, specifically, you specify the model architecture that you wanna use. Okay, sorry, this is really not very happy about flipping through this. Okay, so you need to specify the training data set um, that you wanna use and we have different options, the model architecture. Um, the, um, you need to initialize the model um, and that involves choosing a, a specific backend. Um, and then there's the standardized model detection API. Um, and if you wanna make some changes, that's straightforward. So here I've changed it from mask RCNN to faster RCNN, so a different model architecture. Um, in the first part of this path, you can change um, the data set that it was trained on. And you can also switch to a different backend. And so Layout Parser has a pre-trained model zoo with different um, data types of data that we've trained it on. Um, and so if your data set looks like um, one of the documents that we've pre-trained it on, you can use it off the shelf and it uh, will work reasonably well in those contexts. And this is something that we're expanding over time. Um, in determining how layout parser can meet your needs, it's important to ask three questions. So how different is the target data um, from uh, the pre-trained models in our model zoo. Obviously, the more uh, different your document is, the more you're going to need customization. What are your accuracy and efficiency requirements? Um, and how much training data do you have available? And so there's different cases. So let's say um, that your target uh, data are very similar to one of our models and you really care about efficiency, that's a great case for using layout parser off the shelf. It will only take you those three lines of code and you can choose um, a, a backend uh, that supports efficient annotation. So this might be particularly likely if you're an undergrad, um, you know, working in industry, um, et cetera. You know, on the other hand, um, it may be that your documents are pretty different from anything that's in our model zoo. In that case, you're gonna need model fine tuning and layout par parser supports that fine tuning. Um, if it's also the case um, that there's not, your, your documents look really different from what's in our model zoo and you don't have training data, um, you're going to need to annotate data. And layout parser comes with a tool um, based on Label Studio for data annotation. Um, and I'm gonna kind of um, skip through this because I don't have a ton of time, um, but I also wanna say that, you know, a big part of the challenge of making deep learning feasible is you need to choose the right examples to annotate. Um, you know, if you just draw images at random to annotate, you're gonna oversample from the center of your distribution, undersample from the tails, and you're not going to be happy with performance. And so we've done some work along this lines as well um, in a paper on my website that uh, develops an active learning framework for document image analysis. And we actually build that framework um, into the layout, um, into the Label Studio tool, tool that comes with Layout Parser. And we build in some other useful changes to the labeling interface that we found just through our projects um, help us to annotate much more efficiently. And so um, when you download Layout Parser, you can also download um, the version of Label Studio, which is an open source tool where we've made um, some modifications to the UI um, that we found particularly helpful in annotating economic documents, just in terms of the interface and in terms of active learning. Okay. Um, so you may also want to do post-processing on your documents. Um, and so the layout data structures that we've designed as part of Layout Parser are really meant to 
facilitate post-processing. So for example, suppose that you wanna do some post-processing where you select a single column from your table or your document. Here's an example of how you can do that with a couple of lines of code. And now you see you've selected the um, article and the section headers from this uh, column of the page. And there's um, lots of ways in which you can use um, the outputs of layout analysis for post-processing in a way that's very streamlined. Um, layout parser builds a series of wrappers um, among existing OCR engines that you can call. So currently you can call Tesseract and Google Cloud Vision. So you do the layout detection, you know, if you're doing it off the shelf with three lines of code, and then you need another three lines of code to do the OCR. Um, and layout parser allows you to easily visualize the OCR side by side with the results of the layout detection. Um, and so you can see that here. Um, on the left, you're visualizing the results of the layout detection. And on the right, you see the OCR text that it appears you know, um, on you know, the, the same scale as the original page. Um, we really like to encourage community participation so people can share their models. Um, you know, the more we have coverage of different data sets, coverage of different backends, kind of the more useful the tool is going to be for people. Um, we have a platform to share your entire pipelines as well to hopefully make it be kind of more transparent um, uh, to researchers how um, DIA pipelines um, work for different examples. So these are um, in our, um, our model um, sharing repository. Um, I have a knowledge base that I've created. If you're just getting started with deep learning methods for data curation, it has links to lots of useful resources. Um, and we'd encourage everyone um, to join our community. We have a website, a Slack group, et cetera. And so what's next? Um, I already mentioned um, that kind of the main thing we've been working on is a more customizable approach for OCR. Um, and so generally you have two approaches. You could, um, you could simulate data that looks like your documents um, and use that to train conventional OCR, which is where we started using GANs built for conditional image synthesis and style transfer to simulate document images that look like our document images. But then we essentially realized we could use the exact same framework for unsupervised OCR um, using style GAN too late in spaces. And so again, I don't really have time to go into the details. Um, but essentially the intuition is that you have these semantically rich representations of characters and latent space, and therefore representations of the same character from different in different fonts. So in the historical font in your document versus in a modern font that has a Unicode label associated with it, um, we'll have embeddings that are similar to each other in this latent space. Uh, you can combine that with a transformer-based language model to get um, unsupervised OCR. This is something we've been working a lot on and um, hopefully we'll be able to integrate into the layout parser package. There's other things we'd like to do. So, um, you know, we haven't worked on this yet, but it's aspirational, you know, having a more generalized layout analysis model rather than the multiple models for different, you know, types of documents. Um, and then what was already asked, multimodal modeling for layout analysis, which is another area that I think is super promising. Um, so just to conclude, um, I'll say like essentially, you know, um, I've argued that data curation is a super important part of being able to do um, meaningful economic research to answer questions that are important to people's lives. Um, and deep learning offers an enormous potential to curate new types of data that haven't been accessible, either just because they're too large to digitize manually or because they come from sources that we wouldn't have even thought of as data. But deep learning gives us the ability to process these sources at scale. In particular, by taking the work we've done and releasing it as part of this open source package um, layout parser, we hope to make these tools um, more broadly accessible to the research community and to also build a community around advancing these methods. And so we'd very much love to have you check out layout parser. You know, if you find it useful to your research, join. 
um, our Slack group, join the community and consider contributing um, any models that you train uh, with Layout Parser uh, back to the community. All right, thanks. I think now we can um, open it up to questions. Thanks, Melissa. That was uh, that was amazing. And as Melissa just mentioned, feel free to add your questions to the to the Q and A function. Um, let me start by uh, reading one from uh, Chris Manning, one of our uh, senior AI researchers here at Stanford, who's done a, a lot of uh, pioneering work in the field. And and uh, he agrees that you what you're doing is is better than any of the commercial stuff out there. And he says, no offense to economists, but it's actually pretty incredible that you're doing better and, and more modern document layout analysis and OCR package than the commercial providers. What's the human interest story back backstory about how you got started doing this and, and scaled up? Uh, you said a little bit about it, but maybe you could elaborate further on that. Yeah, I think essentially I just got tired of not being able to answer questions I wanted to answer because the, you know, I couldn't digitize the data and I got tired of dealing with manual data entry that were just, you know, I feel like a lot of fundamental questions that we want to understand, you just can't get at them with this, with, with aggregated data. So we just kind of went from there. And like I said, I don't think it was <laughs> super efficient to start out with. I didn't know much about deep learning, but kind of at its core, in some sense, deep learning is an optimization problem. It's like applied math. And so I think mm -hmm. as economists, we're heavily trained in optimization and that actually makes it possible for us to kind of delve into this literature, like if you're willing to make, uh, make the investments to do so. And you've uh, created a community, not just the, the pre-docs and others who are working with you, but now this, this broader community that um, are you know, open source basically adding to it. Um, in addition to improving the methods and, and the layouts that are recognized, um, is some of the content, once it's been digitized, these you know, millions of documents from, from Japan and, and historical newspapers, are there uh, repositories where people can, can skip the parsing step and go straight to uh, using now available historical data, or does that tend to be, you know, copyrighted or, or, or proprietary to the researchers who who did the work to develop it? Yeah, I think it kind of depends on the context, and so in some cases there are concerns about copyright. In some cases, you know, things are more open. So, like a lot of the newspapers that we're digitizing, they're in a Library of Congress database, and they're actually the the older ones going back in time are actually in the public domain. And what's the what's the cutoff of that? Is like seventy five years or yeah, it, Mickey Mouse essentially. It's all designed to protect Mickey Mouse. So right. it, it keeps getting longer. You know, the older Mickey Mouse gets. Um, and so. I think like there's yeah, other. That's not, even a, that's not even a joke that Melissa's saying. Yeah, they, they, the Congress does keep updating it to, to <laughs> at the behest of Disney and others to uh, to lengthen their their property. And they rights, make but... other countries do it as well. So in the middle of this work, Japan changed their copyright law because of the Trans Pacific Partnership Agreement. So yeah, unfortunately, it has a broad reach. So a couple other questions. Um, so not every researcher is comfortable doing even the, the, the simple one line coding that you described. Um, have you seen people using layout parser, digitizing documents and, and then and then you know um, having a, a way to access it more easily? Um, yeah, so I mean, I think like, you know, we, we do have some people complain about like, you know, installing, installing Python and, you know, we, we've, we've tried to make it as user friendly as, um, as possible. And that was also part of our motivation for having, um, you know, multiple backends um, is, um, you know, as much as like, I think Detectron 2 is pretty straightforward to get installed, you know, there's, kind of, you know, uh, th there's other backends that are actually more efficient. So we've really tried to kind of aim to make it as efficient as possible, but it is in Python. I have no idea how, you know, or if one could go about doing this in R. So I think there is kind of a, um, a basic kind of requirement of some basic um, uh, Python literacy, but a lot less than if you were trying to do it from scratch. And definitely if you want to use the models off the shelf, I mean, you really, you can just take the code I showed in the slides and um, right. go from there. Um, Diego, Michael has a couple of questions about the resolution needed. And I imagine that the resolution affects it somewhat. How, how, how much of an issue is that? And, and what's the minimum resolution? Yeah, so I think like that's going to depend again, kind of on exactly um, what you want to process. And so, um, 
with the newspaper project that I was showing, those scans are not great resolution and it still tends to work um, pretty well. Um, with the historical Japanese, um, we have kind of um, higher needs for resolution. Just there's like tens of thousands of characters in Japanese and they can be only very slightly different. Um, and so you, if you get enough deterioration in resolution, it's even hard for like a human um, to tell things. But I think in general, like for the layout analysis, you don't need good resolution at all. For OCR, you might need much higher resolution documents, but it's gonna depend a little bit on what you wanna process. If you're processing, you know, kind of English documents in a, you know, a fairly standard font, you're in pretty good shape regardless. Sure. We just have a couple of minutes left, but we have a, a few related questions from uh, Aparna, Seshu, Bertrand. They all ask about some of the best examples of applications of these tools, something that you've, you've been able to learn now that you wouldn't have been able to before. So maybe talk a little bit about, about what discoveries are possible. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think that um, one of the things that, that we've been most excited by is being able to apply this to um, historical media. And so there is a huge, you know, a huge literature on media and the role that it plays in influencing public opinion and um, in the spread of information. Um, but essentially, quite limited work looking historically, even though uh, literally like half a billion pages of historical newspapers have been scanned. Um, but just the OCR you get from feeding them to like Abby Fine Reader or whatever, which is what Library of Congress did, is pretty much um, garbage. Um, and so by running um, this layout analysis, we're now doing things like um, tracking who runs what type of content. And so a high percentage of content in local small town newspapers uh, comes from the AP wire or comes from syndicates. And so we can track at you know, the level of these small towns, who's running what, where did they get it from? We can use named entity recognition on these articles to figure out you know, in the byline where the article was written, um, you know, where the article is talking about, and then just look at kind of all kinds of fascinating questions about how the content that people got exposed to changed across time. And so, you know, if you go back to the 19 teens, actually the majority of kind of content coming from socialist writers in American newspapers is in places like Oklahoma, where you wouldn't have really expected it based on kind of modern political preferences, but you can, kind of see all of that with this data. You can see the networks of content dissemination, who prints what content from where. You can think about topics, um, you know, potentially about sentiment on highly polarizing issues. And so there's just, you know, there's just a huge number of questions there about media that it opens up, like when you combine um, you know, the actual structured text with all the amazing advances that there's been in NLP over the past few years. Yeah, that's great. Do you, I mean, lately, like today, in the past few days, there's been a lot of discussion of, of Facebook and other social media and uh, the outrage that it's stoking in different groups or problems of misinformation, managing misinformation. Um, when you go back historically, uh, this is an unfair question, but, but do you have any uh, sense of, of whether that was worse, better, different in some dimension that you can summarize very briefly? <laughs> I think like misinformation is a major like a major problem historically as well so it's certainly not new to the present and also polarization i mean one thing that that we're looking at is um content on the vietnam war and i mean it's it's pretty polarized and so i think that there's a tendency to say that this that the problems we face today are unique to today um but you know historically there um, in the 1950s, say papers had a morning edition and an afternoon edition, you know, before there was television, it wasn't constant 24 hours, but there, there was a lot of content coming out of these newspapers and it was, um, it was pretty polarized, it was pretty sensationalized. Um, and so I don't think that that's, um, that's something that's at all unique to the present. Yeah, it's great to have the historical perspective. Well, thank you so much, Melissa. That was amazing. And, and it's uh, it's opening up just a whole new category of, of research that, that not just you, but a lot of others can start doing that. So we're very grateful for you, what you're sharing today and also for the work you've been doing. 
And uh, so thank you, Melissa. And let me also uh, let everybody know that we've got a, uh, our next seminars on October 18th. We've got Lin Wu coming in from uh, Wharton. And she's going to be talking about innovation strategy after an IPO. I just popped a link into the chat with the uh, 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 URL where you can see the future seminars, including Lin Wu's. So I look forward to seeing you all on October 8th. Thanks again, it, uh, Melissa. This was uh, amazing. And I appreciate you taking the time to share it with us. Yeah, thank you so much.